Hello, everybody. Okay, obviously you may hear me, but I'll try to adjust it a little bit. Uh, is it okay if I uh, speak that way? I don't need to be closer to the microphone? Okay. Uh, again, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Alexey Brodkin and today we are going to talk about uh, how a Zephyr R toast might be helpful to uh, leverage all the benefits of your uh, modern multi-core design. And uh, so let me uh, start uh, first uh, uh, a couple of words about myself. Uh, you may read something here. Basically, uh, I've been doing embedded uh, software development for a couple of years, well, more than 10 years already, and mostly these are deeply embedded things on modern 32-bit microprocessors or uh, microcontrollers, if you will. And so I've been doing uh, a lot of open source uh, as well, and so lately I started to deal with uh, Zephyr Artos. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, first, uh, uh, we'll uh, see, I'll try to convince you that uh, there is actually a demand on, uh, of multi-core uh, deeply embedded or basically embedded systems, and so uh, hopefully uh, you'll see what is a real need for that. And then uh, we'll go to uh, a, a discussion of uh, uh, two fundamental uh, fundamentally different approaches with uh, multi-core design, and so uh, then we'll see how those are mapped uh, to the uh, Zephyr RTOS, how it could be used there. And so uh, then we'll spend a little bit more time with SMP, uh, because it is, uh, on, from one point of view, it is more standard, and so uh, that's why applicable to a wider variety of different hardware but so uh, then it is also quite a tricky one because it requires you to deal with uh, a couple of interesting things. Uh, so let me continue then uh, with uh, what we have here. So uh, why actually uh, we might want to use multi-core in embedded systems? It uh, sounds quite strange today, but uh, we are getting there. So. Uh, what happens? Uh, we, there is no such thing as uh, enough performance because uh, whenever we have uh, more performance, we are trying to do more funky stuff. And so that's why at some point we end up having way too many work to be done. And so what we do, we try uh, to achieve more. Uh, so what, what we need to do? We need to execute more instructions per second, for example. And how we achieve that, uh, if we are not talking about improvements in uh, CPU architecture, so we are trying to execute instructions uh, faster. So we uh, try to uh, make our clock uh, be higher and higher. And at some point, we end up with a couple of things, uh, either together or separately. So uh, we may have a problem because we cannot scale our uh, frequency any longer because our tech process doesn't allow us to do so. Or we may see that so we are already dissipating uh, so much power that our package just cannot uh, resist that. So we, we cannot uh, increase our uh, frequency any longer. But uh, then we may have uh, another challenge. So for example, uh, what if we have a, a critical task we cannot afford uh, switching off uh, and uh, uh, let another uh, task, another uh, application to be running. So then we want uh, that particular uh, thread of execution to be always, uh, to always have uh, uh, real hardware uh, to work on, so we may immediately start it or we may not even stop it. And so uh, another very interesting topic, we may have a very specific task like uh, convolution neural network or uh, DSP of some kind, which if implemented on a normal uh, general purpose CPU, it will ruin all the performance because it will require so much compute time that you won't be able to do anything else uh, while doing even not that many of uh, DSP or CNN. So uh, what then we may do? Uh, we may use just uh, more CPUs. And so then these uh, CPU cores or uh, different uh, CPUs itself, uh, with that we have a scaling of megahertz. So we used to have one CPU and now we have two. So we used to have uh, megahertz bu budget like 1,000 megahertz and now we have two or three or four, whatever. So we may obviously do more. Or uh, we may keep one core for execution of uh, something and so uh, all the rest for anything else that we need. Uh, and that's why we gain uh, real, uh, not pseudo, but real uh, parallel execution, which also helps. Or we may want to use a special accelerator course, which will do something very efficiently like that, CNN or DSP or something. So uh, that's what we are getting. And so uh, here are a couple of real life examples. So for example, LTE modems. 
uh, they are interesting because uh, computational uh, uh, amount of computations we need to do to implement LTE stack is tremendous. And it is not only a control stack, uh, we have a lot of DSP calculations. So typical designs, they consist of a couple of DSPs or even ACIPs. And so also we have a general purpose CPU as well uh, because we need to do all these calculations and why we need multi-core because uh, we may even have a telephone call like a voice call and we want to process that as well and not being interrupted because we are transferring data. Uh, one other uh, uh, good example is audio video DSP because you want to have your cell phone uh, playing music but not consuming all your battery in an hour or uh, as I mentioned already AI or, or a video recognition uh, video processors uh, you want to have a separate core which may have uh, like a couple of thousand uh, max which will do multiplication and accumulation in uh, one cycle compared to you to what you have like one or two or max on your normal uh, CPU. And so that might be uh, very efficient as well. And another thing you may have like user interface which consumes a lot of uh, compute resources and still you want to be, uh, to be it to be smooth and uh, do something else as well. And so that's a typical design which we used to have uh, lately. So we have probably we used to have only one core but then we uh, went with multiple cores. And so uh, still that looks quite simple. But uh, then example that's just uh, your uh, cell phone or something and then you want uh, to play music on the go and uh, again uh, keep your battery safe and not uh, drained in an hour. So you add a DSP core which uh, does only one thing, it uh, decodes something and uh, feeds your deck for example. And so that thing communicates with your CPU through a special mailbox for example. It's not uh, obligatory so but so uh, let's assume that so uh, to, to display complexity which we may face. And then you want so uh, something else, you want your phone uh, to consume again no power uh, when in standby mode but so uh, then you want it to react on something when you for example uh, when you walk and it will count your steps or if, for example uh, if you talk to that uh, hello my device it also wakes up. So you have a separate very uh, downscale CPU core which only talks with sensors and send interrupt to the main core whenever it is uh, whenever it thinks it's the right time. And so then you have uh, desire also to recognize object with your uh, camera on your smartphone and so that's how you end up with a vision processor which again had, have a couple of uh, thousand multiplication units and uh, may do that recognition uh, in a snap without uh, actually consuming a lot of power. And so what uh, we may see here actually is the first part is uh, uh, AMP cluster which an AMP stands for asymmetric multiprocessor cluster which means we have two completely different CPUs here and so we have to deal somehow with that and we have something more generic which is SMP cluster uh, which means we have uh, which is uh, which stands for uh, symmetric pro multiprocessing which means we have exactly the same CPUs here. And you may see that uh, entire picture is a quite a good example of modern heterogeneous uh, SOC and most of the SOCs these days they, they look like that. So you see they're quite complex because you use uh, different processors, you use different means of communication between them and now let's uh, take a deeper look at uh, those uh, different types of uh, multiprocessing implementation. The first is AMP and the first because that's the simplest in some sense because you may take uh, completely different CPUs which will differ even in instruction set architecture. They may have access to different peripherals uh, different memories and all that and still you have it into uh, same one uh, design into same so into same SOC and so that will work. Uh, they may use uh, different communication channels or they may not have uh, any communication channels as well. You have a lot of flexibility here but for that you have to pay. Uh, it's hard to implement something which works for any design and so it's hard to add yet another core because you will need uh, to think about uh, software partitioning uh, before you actually deploy that on your SOC on your device and uh, it's hard to update it later. You need to update either entire firmware or if you have FPGA as one of the uh, members here you have even harder time. Uh, so it's not scalable and you need to think and advance uh, a lot uh, but that's simple. Another thing you have SMP which stands for symmetric multiprocessing that is easier and harder uh, at the same time. It's uh, easier because uh, you may for example run the same uh, software which you need to either recompile or even use it in non-recompilable form because it may accommodate from one to say four cores and it will uh, scale automatically on the on those execution units that you have with help of its uh, built-in scheduler for example. 
But uh, what is more complex because it, re it has quite a strong requirements. Given you want to run the same uh, binary, the same software on all the cores, you need to have obviously the same memory which they, which they share. And if you have caches, you need to even to have uh, the, those caches coherence, so we, which itself adds uh, even hardware problems. Uh, but what else uh, here you need to think about scheduling in a runtime. That's good and that's bad. It, that's good because you don't need to think about that in advance before you actually uh, deploy that, but then you need to uh, implement a scheduler in uh, such a good way so that it may actually allow you to use uh, your performance of your hardware in the best way and not spending, uh, wasting time on doing something useless. Uh, so yeah, and you th need to think about load balancing, ability to probably pin your task to some core. So there are quite a lot of things you need to think about. So why uh, we are talking uh, about that in conjunction with uh, Zephyr RTOS. Uh, operating system allows us uh, to uh, simplify development quite a lot because it allows us to use already implemented abstractions. And uh, especially talking about multi-core designs, if you do, if you want to do it from scratch and entirely yourself, you need to think about scheduling uh, interfaces for communications and uh, drivers and all that. But when you use already uh, existing operating system, which at least uh, provides you drivers and uh, some subsystems, this is completely uh, different situation. That's much easier. And in the in the best case, when your uh, you, when your board is already supported, what you need to do, yeah, just you just need uh, to basically uh, create a simple application which will print Hello World and so uh, it will be printed on your console. So well, that's a benefit and that's why we are implementing a special support of uh, either AMP or SMP in Zephyr as well. So uh, what we have uh, for AMP is in Zephyr, uh, from, this, uh, from the very first commit, AMP was already there and so there was a platform which is now discontinued which is called uh, Arduino or Genuino 101 uh, which was produced by Intel and so uh, there we had uh, two different cores, Intel x86 and Arc uh, EM core and they were working together. Uh, they were on the same SOC and so uh, they used only shared memory and some control systems, uh, control signals for communication with each other. Well in fact only x86 core was able to uh, tell something to uh, signal something to our core but uh, not the other way around but they shared memory so they had a, uh, a channel for data exchange. But now we have more of them, we have an XP uh, boards, we have ST and uh, some other sense I think with in future we'll see more. Uh, and so here you may see uh, how that's uh, actual communication between core uh, used to work. On x86 core on power on we just uh, uh, put some value in the control register which uh, then generated the signal to actually start our core which then signaled okay if it was able to start or not. So it, it was that simple and we didn't need to implement uh, some other funky stuff. Still it was true multi-core system. Uh, also in Zephyr we have uh, something called OpenAMP that's a de facto standard for uh, AMP systems and it allows a lot of flexibility. It uses Virch.io for uh, as a transport interface. So uh, it could be used for completely different situations for different designs and I recommend if you have any interest about that uh, to take a look at that uh, presentation which was done on Linaro Connect uh, last year I think. Uh, so you have a link here, download my slides and so you'll be able to get much more information about that. Uh, but uh, in Zephyr we have OpenMP uh, also we have a, a sort of a sub uh, version of OpenMP which only use RPM messages so you cannot uh, with that control execution or life cycle of your software but so you may uh, basically exchange data between cores. It is very tiny, it is uh, small and nice and very suitable for really deeply embedded things and again if you want uh, to get more details you have another link for another presentation which covers that in much more details. And so uh, now uh, talking about SMP in Zephyr, uh, it's uh, started to appear much later and so uh, probably you'll understand why. So uh, it uh, first was implemented in uh, February 2018 for ESP boards and uh, that was interesting because that boards, uh, that SOC has actually two cores but uh, the only way of communication between uh, two cores is shared memory. They don't even have uh, cross core interrupts uh, which I will uh, touch a little bit later. And so then uh, one year later exactly, exactly uh, there was uh, support for uh, SMP for x86 uh, in QMU and so one of the reasons for that actually a 64 bit version 
uh, x86 uh, to be supported was uh, to leverage uh, SMP uh, in uh, simulation because before that you had to use uh, that particular board which you may not have on your desk and now with QMU you may actually play with SMP on any computer so that that's quite convenient. And then finally, uh, a couple of months ago, we introduced SMP support for architecture, and uh, uh, that's interesting because that's the real uh, first real hardware which is uh, fully supported for SMP because we have not only shared memory but we have uh, cross-core interrupt, and uh, that really helps to implement SMP in a very efficient way. And we support uh, as well simulation platform and uh, real board as well. Uh, now uh, speaking about uh, SMP in a little bit more details, uh, so still uh, there are a couple of things we might improve uh, because so uh, these are still early days. Uh, but anyway, so uh, even at this point we use uh, again shared memory, we use cross core interrupts uh, to inform another core that uh, that core needs to drop all that task which being used, which being uh, executed and uh, switch to something more important, for example, uh, we use so uh, cluster-wise uh, clock, so every core may uh, get uh, some feeling of uh, if it's the time to do something else, for example, to run a scheduler again. And so, uh, well, we use uh, atomic instructions because otherwise uh, it's hard to implement uh, synchronization primitives here as well. Uh, another interesting feature which was introduced uh, not that long ago is ability to pin your task for a particular CPU core, as I mentioned. Uh, sometimes we want to do that and so the reason we want to do that because actually uh, migration of a test from one CPU core to another might be quite costly because uh, it might not be seen to the uh, software developer but internally we have a lot of uh, cache states like obviously we have instruction caches, we have data caches, we have uh, multiple level of caches but it's not all. We have branch predictor caches, we have uh, if we use MMU, which we don't use in Zephyr so far, we have MMU, and for MMU we have TLB cache, and so uh, all of that, uh, when we uh, go from one core to another, we lose all that uh, cache information, and that means we need uh, to get it first uh, before we can uh, go full steam. And that's important consideration, especially thinking about uh, Zephyr, which is uh, very for very deeply embedded things, and every cycle is very important for us. We cannot uh, spend 1,000 cycles just for task switching. but. Anyways, there is a way to uh, pin a task, even though uh, only uh, with one type of scheduler, uh, which is called uh, dump uh, scheduler, which just uh, a normal queue of uh, uh, threads. And so, why don't we have it for other type of schedulers? Because e for others, uh, you may have, for example, pri higher priority and task of higher priority in RTOS by uh, definition won't be. Uh, scheduled to wait. It will execute until it is done. So if we have uh, some task which has high priority and it is always executed, it'll, it will occupy that core infinitely. So it's not a problem. Uh, so uh, what are we going uh, to do uh, else? Uh, obviously we need to add more platforms because so far we have, as I mentioned, Xtensa, we have uh, x86 which makes not much sense in a deeply embedded world, and ARC. Obviously we need to add ARM there, uh, RISC V, uh, and whatever, MIPS, probably, if it is still alive and of any interest. Uh, then we want to add more benchmarks and uh, tests uh, so you may get a feeling how your SMP implementation really works and there are quite some quirks. We have uh, very basic tests uh, so far and I used it personally for development but uh, again we need more and so we'll get to that a little bit later as well. Uh, well, uh, at some point we may want to add more cores to the cluster and so uh, there is no real technical limitation of uh, supporting four cores so far but just because we never used any more and that's why we were happy and it's easier to add more and so uh, obviously we want to think about uh, more complicated and uh, more you know smart scheduler mechanism which will take into account uh, exactly those uh, things we need so uh, to care about like uh, scheduling uh, penalty and uh, peculiarities of uh, this particular CPU or this particular design. Uh, now uh, speaking about uh, things that we had to do uh, in, uh, in uh, Zephyr to support SMP, uh, we had to do quite a lot of things. And uh, still what's interesting, uh, though most of these things they were uh, architecture independent, which means Whenever we get uh, that done, uh, all the architectures already may benefit from that. They may just reuse that effort and only implement uh, one tiny thing which is 
uh, uh, functionality which, which actually thre uh, switches threads. Uh, that's pretty much the, the one thing that is required from the architecture. So what we had to do, we had uh, to uh, add initialization of uh, slave cores because previously when we had only one uh, core and one, execu one execution unit, we essentially we had to initialize that. But now we need to initialize those cores which, which might even start halted or they might start running and we need to hold them, we initialize and to let them run once again executing already useful stuff. Uh, also, we need to, uh, we had to rework uh, uh, locking primitives because uh, when you have only one execution, you need the only uh, problem you may face is interrupt because that's how you may get uh, to execution of the same code which you used to execute before interrupt. But in case of uh, multiple cores, you may get uh, to execution of the same core uh, of the same code uh, just by another core. And uh, now we need to think about spin locks. So we may have a critical section which is not entered by anybody else uh, while one executor is already using that. And that's, that obviously adds complexity and uh, we pay for that because uh, whenever two cores want to access the same uh, uh, critical uh, code path, uh, some of them will wait, just wasting time, which is not good, but we have to do that. Uh, also, we had uh, to uh, improve scheduler uh, in such a way so we know that we have a couple of execution units. Again, before we had just uh, one execution unit, we have a long list of threads, for example, and we just executed it one by one. Now we have multiple execution units and we need to think about how to schedule those uh, uh, multiple tasks uh, on different CPUs uh, simultaneously or like one by one. So uh, there were quite a few complexities. And in the end, we had to implement a little bit different scheduling, not scheduling, but task switching mechanism because uh, before we had a couple of uh, logs there in the code. And uh, given uh, that code is uh, being executed, uh, being implemented in low level assembly now. Uh, we didn't want to have any logs implemented in, in assembly. So that's why we uh, moved uh, most of the code uh, to generic part and it's only left a very minimal amount of uh, uh, implementation which is architecture specific and uh, obviously is, is written in assembly. So uh, quite a lot of things uh, were done and so uh, it worked quite well now. Uh, now speaking about so uh, hardware peculiarities, we need to think about uh, when we are uh, talking about uh, true SMP system and so uh, it it has to do not only with Zephyr but any other operating system or no operating system as well. So here you see a block diagram of uh, again quite more than SOC which consists of two cores and uh, some other things. So what is important uh, when we are talking about SMP again we need to have exactly the same instruction set architecture so that we may use exactly the same binary uh, on all execute the same binary by all execution units and uh, we need to have shared memory. And with shared memory, uh, it's not that easy. I mentioned already that if you have caches, they have to be uh, coherent. But so there is another thing. Most of, uh, or at least a lot of uh, embedded systems, what they have, they have uh, uh, very fast on board m on chip memory, uh, which is nice because uh, instead of a couple of hundred cycles latency, you have like one or two cycles, which is nice. But uh, as it turned out, uh, since we came from uh, single core designs, um, a lot of those memories uh, might be so called private, which means they are accept access accessed only from uh, one core. And in our case, it doesn't work because given we use the same variable which is supposed to be mapped to address X. We can access it from one core and write something, but another core won't treat whatever previous core, the first core uh, wrote there. So then we need to use only memory which is shared between all the CPUs and visible exactly in the same way. So it might be a situation when you may access that private memory from another core through some debug interface, for example, but it won't work. You need to access exactly the same variable at exactly the same address and read the same value which was written before by, not by another core. So you have to be careful with that. Uh, also, it's important to have uh, ability to uh, to to you to implement uh, interrupts between cores uh, so that uh, one core may signal another. Because otherwise, what happens if we have uh, if we don't have interrupts between cores, uh, one core starts to execute a task and executes that. Uh, uh, until uh, it decides it needs to stop execution and only then it starts scheduler and may pick up another thread, another execution, another application. But what if uh, we, uh, we know uh, so far that we need to drop execution of that thing because we have something of higher priority. And uh, since we don't have any way to, uh, uh, to inform that core from outside, uh, we'll, we'll just need to wait until it gets interrupted from the timer, for example, run scheduler, and then understand, okay, I need to do something else. But if we have that ability to inform it, uh, like to force uh, do it something, or at least uh, trigger execution of the scheduler, uh, it helps to lower latencies uh, significantly. So that's a really hard requirement. 
And so a cluster clock, as I mentioned, so is, is also important because we, it's much easier to track uh, time and uh, know whenever I need to do something. And so that's how it really works. Uh, now speaking about uh, challenges we may face uh, developing software for SMP system, uh, we need to think about scheduling because uh, we do it in runtime and uh, if we don't, don't do it right then we may uh, lose our performance for nothing. And so uh, we need to think about uh, migration cost for between CPUs and so uh, we need to do it uh, for benchmarking otherwise so uh, it's hard to to understand what's really going on. And we have to take uh, care about shared resources because uh, we cannot use uh, the same peripheral simultaneously by two cores and so uh, then we need to implement uh, those locking and so uh, that's how we may lo lose uh, some performance as well. And so uh, now I uh, wanted to show that how easy it is. So if your platform and your board is supported so in Zephyr configuration utility, you just uh, say, okay, I want to use SMP, I have a couple of cores and you rebuild and get it executed. So uh, that, that's, that it is that simple. And so speaking about tests, which we are not uh, having enough, uh, enough uh, quantity, uh, to actually uh, measure how we may use, uh, what kind of scaling we may get with multiple cores, I had to implement my own application, which is uh, yet to be accepted, even though there are no uh, more comments and pro probably it will be pulled in like any day now. Uh, so what that application does, it uh, uh, creates multiple threads and in which of the threads uh, it's just com uh, computes uh, P uh, in uh, certain, uh, with a uh, uh, certain amount of uh, symbols with a certain precision. And so, uh, so uh, when I uh, compile it and execute it and uh, use it, uh, two different precisions, so uh, one was uh, 120 digits and another was uh, twice more. So you may see here uh, how performance actually scales and uh, that's really nice to see that when you have task which uh, consumes quite a lot of time, I mean it is not interrupted quite rapidly, you may actually get uh, almost uh, three and a half times uh, performance uh, bump which is good. It means you have four cores, you get almost four times uh, more uh, stuff to be done. But uh, when you start decreasing the amount of uh, work you do in one, th in one task, you may uh, see how uh, significantly your performance may drop. So even you have four cores, you barely get uh, to two and a four uh, X. But that's not all. Uh, so if I uh, get back to uh, stuff we run on Linux, and so that's uh, one of the tests of EMBC benchmark, uh, EMBC multi-bench. Uh, in that benchmark, you may see that even execution on four cores uh, doesn't give us even uh, Tw uh, two times of improvement. So in, in that basically means uh, depending on, you c in you on your use case, you may either get uh, quite a nice improvement uh, of performance or you may get pretty much nothing. So it's important so to uh, really make your uh, goods uh, profiling, not even estimation, but pro preferably profiling and figure out what is your workload and how you may improve on that. Uh, so uh, getting to the end of that uh, quite a short talk, uh, so what I wanted to highlight here, so Zephyr uh, provides you with enough uh, capabilities to leverage multi-core designs of different types, be it uh, uh, simple and ordinary SMP or it is heterogeneous system because together with SMP you may have, as I showed on my blog diagram before, uh, you may have different CPUs so you have really SMP plus AMP as well, it is also possible and so that's what we typically have. And so that's always good to have in sync your uh, hardware team and software team so that you have hardware which is already probably supported in your software and uh, from software standpoint you have all the required hardware interfaces and mechanisms uh, that uh, you'd like to actually use in your software. And so then uh, I uh, uh, invite you to participate in Zephyr development so that's a quite nice uh, community uh, with all the development on GitHub. You are welcome with your bug reports, pull requests and uh, so I'll be happy to see more people contributing. Oh, thanks. So uh, that's pretty much it from my side. I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. We have uh, about five minutes for that. Sure. Uh, are we going to provide a microphone or something? Working. Do I need to turn it on? Okay. But it won't be captured on the record. Okay. So. Uh, I noticed in your code example for calculating pi that you were using cooperative threads. Um, doesn't using cooperative threads in SMP and running them in multiple cores break the cooperative promise? Uh, excuse me, could you please repeat it again? Yeah, so in your, in your code example, uh, you were using cooperative threads, unless I'm mistaken, because you're using the macro to create uh, uh, threads of cooperative priority. Okay. And cooperative threads 
by definition, they execute sequentially. If you execute them in, in multiple cores, that means that they're executing at the same time. So it shouldn't, in parallel, yeah, but that's the point. So the, the point of a cooperative threat, the theory is that you, do, you know that you're not going to be preempted by another cooperative threat at the very least, or by, only by an ISR, really. Yes. So by doing that, aren't you breaking the cooperative threat contract? Well, here, uh, intentionally, what I did, I just uh, made priority of uh, those threats. Uh, first, uh, priority is the same for all those extra threats, and it is even higher than your uh, main threat. So that's all the uh, computational power that you have uh, will be used by your threats. And given they have the same priority, they will be uh, scheduled to as many CPUs as you, as you have. And then uh, whenever uh, one task ends, uh, another one gets scheduled to this uh, CPU. And that's why I used here uh, 16 threads, and uh, given I run it on two or four core configuration, it means we have an enough of uh, uh, reruns of the pretty much the same thread on, on different CPUs. Yeah, I do, I do understand that, but uh, I wonder if Zephyr should re, uh, rethink whether a cooperative thread uh, or two cooperative threads should be allowed to run concurrently on two cores, because if you did that for certain subsystems that we have now that rely on the fact that cooperative threads cannot be preempted by a, or cannot run it concurrently with another uh, cooperative thread, that's gonna break. So some of the subsystems. So, well, you know what I mean? Well, probably we'd better discuss it offline because sure, sure, I, I sure. don't I'm quite just, understand you know, <laughs> and I'd like to uh, figure out what, what, I just what you're talking to raise about. It because we saw that and then immediately thought of some subsystems that rely on that fact. If not, neither does, you were gonna compile that for an SMP system and the, those cooperative threads were actually scheduled to run on multiple CPUs, that would break today. Okay. Yeah, that's... Okay, anybody else? Yes, I have one question. Uh, uh, I've seen in slides that you are introducing the global SMP lock, and about 12 years ago, there was huge work in all big operating systems like Linux, BSDs, and so on, to basically get rid of that concept because it slows down the whole kernel. Uh, uh, this is perceived as temporary solution until pair subsystems locks will appear or because of simplicity of the Zephyr we are going to have Giant lock? I think we'll go in the same way as Linux development goes. We are not uh, planning uh, that far in advance. So uh, as long as it works, uh, that's good. I understand that there are quite a few limitations of that. But see if there is any better uh, solution and uh, somebody is willing to fix that uh, because it really hits him on performance side. I'm pretty sure that will be done. But so, so far, again, what I mentioned, we are quite in early days here. And so I don't think there are any uh, real uh, products which use that, right? So whenever we start uh, seeing people implementing uh, that in real products, essentially we'll get that fixed. I think that on the very beginning, the, the Giant lock is something which is perceived like as easy to use and solving the problem. The question is, uh, could we basically avoid the mistake made uh, by the others? Well, probably so. I don't have any uh, ready answer. Like, uh, I don't, uh, probably Anas may correct me, but we don't have anything in the issues filed on that. Like, we want to get rid of that. Okay, I will file that back. Sure, that's good. Uh, just a question about OpenAMP. Um, last year, there was a big step in uh, OpenAMP release that should uh, improve OpenAMP uh, this RP message. Could you please uh, talk a little bit louder? I barely may hear Sorry. you. So last year, the, there was um, an OpenAMP release uh, that should fix a part of um, the cons you mentioned. I would like to, to, to know if you, you compare uh, RP message lit and OpenAMP based on the old release or the the, I would say the release uh, which now integrated in uh, Zephyr. Well, again, sorry, I, I, I cannot sexually understand uh, your, your <laughs> sorry, question. My, so my probably that's a language bad. barrier between <laughs> I'm ours. French. Um, so, in October uh, 2018, uh, OpenAnt have been released uh, with open uh, what? Un peu NMP, sorry, okay. OpenNMP has been released. Uh, with some improvements uh, in terms of uh, footprint, in terms of uh, uh, API, uh, decoupling of uh, remote proc RP message, 
And I would like to know if your status you show here was based on this new release or was based on the, the previous release? Well, personally, I uh, haven't uh, been dealing with OpenMP uh, quite a lot. I think I see Marine there, so probably she knows a little bit better. What is the status on that? I just want to say that, that um, at Nordic, we've created a benchmark to compare uh, OpenAMP and RP Message Lite, and we've actually made it public on a branch. So the, if, if that's sort of where you're going. We, and, and yes, Zephyr integrates the latest version of OpenAMP minus some commits in the head. So, uh, so I don't know where those numbers came from, but if you're talking about benchmarking OpenAMP in the context of Zephyr, uh, yes, we do have the latest version, and yes, we've run benchmarks to compare it to other AMP systems. And if you're interested, there's a branch there to actually run it on, an, um, on the Expresso uh, PC50, I can't remember the number, but that one, <laughs> which, which was mentioned in the slides. So. Thank you. OK, thank you. Do you have any more time, or we need to conclude on that? OK, so thanks a lot. So I'll be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you.